in, in sequence. Uh, from my left going down, uh, each presenter to just take two minutes to state their position on the topic. So we start with Mr. Allen. Well, I wear the, ha the hat of civil engineer in the, or senior engineer in the civil engineering department of the Bureau of Standards. I'm also a registered professional uh, civil engineer and um, I lecture part-time at university. I lecture very um, briefly, that's for one here full-time. Essentially, the, the topic from an engineering perspective um, cannot generally be, be resolved in, on one side or the other. Um, in concrete itself is a design product and, and hollow concrete blocks or blocks is also a design um, building material. Essentially, if one design concrete, you can design it to particularly any strength that, well, reasonably, uh, any general strength, maybe up to 30, uh, can I try to find a figure, but essentially you can design it for what you want. Block essentially, though, in terms of a Jamaican market, you may find some bit of variability in strength and sometimes the quality control is not as much as you would want it to. From the Bureau of Standards perspective, we'd say that um, once you are buying blocks that have passed the minimum requirement, essentially your structure would be sound. Apart from that, then, you are not really certain of what kind of building you're putting up. Also with concrete, one has to essentially measure the, the, the strength of it, and it can be measured in terms of taking samples of the wet concrete and ensuring that you test your what we call cubes or cylindrical samples. Essentially, you can design for what you want, and quality control will determine whether or not you are meeting the requirement. Testing also then proves whether or not you have met the required standard. Essentially, you can design what you want. Thank you. Now, I, I'm not going to get into the idea of which is better. I'm getting into the idea of cost. And as a quantity surveyor, I believe that using formed concrete is cheaper for a building construction as against using block and steel, based on personal experience as well, based on working it out. Now, in terms of the, the, the form system, you'll see some savings in that one, you would not need to render your walls. And this, I'm, I'm talking about if you're using the filmed face plywood, not the regular form ply, the film face plywood, you would see a cost, a cost saving that you don't have to render. You don't have to render your walls, you don't have to render your jams. Uh, in terms of your steel work, in that uh, Mr. Mr. Allen would talk further about that, but for the walls, you would not necessarily use 12 mm as your vertical bar. You could use 10 mm, which you get more, more lengths per ton. In terms of your conduits and pipes, you would not necessarily need to do chasings and reinstating chasings, because all of those would have been done before the concrete is poured. So you're finding that your, your work is more seamless, and you don't have going back and forth and all that. You have no irises to deal with. You would not need to be doing stiffeners. Uh, you would not need to be doing any lintels in the, build, in the block wall, which would be time consuming as well as more costly. You, in terms of your belt beam, you could you'd still use a belt beam based on my experience, but it would be formed within the wall itself. So based on my understanding and workings, I believe that in terms of not necessarily better, but in terms of a cost, you're looking at a 20, 20 to 25 percent saving in terms of your building cost instead of use it for using formed concrete instead of block work. The issue though with that most Jamaicans are going to have is that it is front loaded as a project in that you would have to find all your concrete up front, your steel, your conduits, your pipes, all of those things up front to get them in the building. A typical Jamaican would probably want to buy a hundred blocks here or two hundred blocks there and build on a section today and another month they do that. With the form system, it don't necessarily work that way. So there are some disadvantages, but overall, on a cost basis, the form system is cheaper. Okay, I come with a different perspective because I sit on both sides of the fence. I'm a professional engineer, I'm a block maker, I'm a contractor, so I've experienced it all. The issue that has, is not a simple one, a lot depends on what you are building. If you are building a very small structure, block and steel is obviously more, more attractive from a cost standpoint. There's no capital cost that you have to put up to buy expensive farmer. 
So you are much easier dealing with block and steel. If it's a simple, if it's a, if it's a modular structure, a lot of repetition, then you're better off with rain with a, with a concrete structure. Okay? You, can, you can afford to buy the farms, got a lot of reuse, so it's a lot more economical. But there's also another very important factor. When you're using block and steel, you're employing a lot more labor. And we know our serious unemployment problem. We have to think about these things. You're employing a lot more subcontractors, a lot more MSMEs basically, people getting work, people getting, people getting paid, people have money to spend, they can buy more goods and services, there's more, there's more, there's more options for people in the productive sector, because there are more people there who can buy your goods and services. When you go to just a plain concrete structure, there's a lot less employment. There's also a lot more foreign exchange being expended, buying farm work and buying steel. When you're using block and steel, there's a lot more local produce, so you're a lot better off. So, there are other ways of looking at this structure, that, that this situation. From a national standpoint, what is best for the country? From the economic standpoint, what is best for the individual doing the construction? So it's not a simple, it's not a simple issue. Something you have to think about very carefully. But one of the essential things is the nature of the structure. So it's difficult to generalize. Um, so far, we've got a, an undecided panel. Um, and I'm not going to do very much to change that. So I'll apologize for that in advance. Uh, but speaking as a contractor, um, you know, what I want is a construction method that's, um, that's fast, that's safe, it gives a, a top quality project, and also where, you know, I don't as a contractor have to come back later and, and fix defects. So I'm, I'm erring on the side of a, of a formed concrete finish, but certainly not decided. Um, I'd like to give a few examples of how and where these two methods have been used. Um, on Kia projects in Jamaica in recent years. So at the moment we're building a warehouse on Aschenheim Road. Um, their block walls about eight meters high with stiffener columns and, and belt beams. Um, a couple of years ago we had two projects on, uh, on Mona Road at the University. We did the Vice Chancery building, the blue building there, uh, that was actually tilt-up concrete panels, so it's not always a formed in situ, but a precast tilt-up panel, about seven inches thick, uh, two stories high. Um, you know, there you've got a nice uh, smooth finish, um, painted on a, a textured sort of trowel-on finish or troweled on a, a finish, and, and you've got a top quality finish. Um, across the road there, we did 400 rooms of student accommodation using a tunnel form method. And there, you know, inside the rooms, just a skim of plaster, coat of paint, and, and again, very good finish with, with no render and the associated uh, problems. And going back a bit, Price Mart on Red Hills Road uh, 10 years ago. Uh, take a look at that. That's got some very, very good uh, block work. Um, moving into St. Kitts now, we're building uh, retaining walls on a resort development, and they're a double skin uh, reinforced block. So retaining walls aren't always... Uh, concrete. So different uh, situations require different solutions. Um, my thoughts on the advantages of, uh, of block and steel. Uh, Jamaica has a, a developed block industry and the standards and plenty of masons um, getting onto employment opportunities as well. Quick mobilization and a low upfront cost as previ previous speakers have, uh, have said, particularly if you're bringing in a uh, a system form system, it takes a lot of planning, upfront cost and, and mobilization time. And contrary to uh, what Mr. Gordon had stated, I, I think a block wall is normally a, a lower cost, a slightly lower cost than a comparable uh, formed concrete wall, although we can have some discussion on that. Advantages of formed concrete, um, structurally, you can change all your parameters, thickness of the wall, the rebar, strength of the concrete, um, to design exactly what you want. Um, if you're retaining water, uh, water tanks, basements, I'd go with uh, formed concrete. Um, done well, you should get a nice finish on your formed concrete. Um, minimal making good. And again, any textured render or trowel on sits a lot better on a formed concrete face um, than it does on a, a rendered block, in, in my opinion. So I think formed concrete comes into its own where there's a high number of reuses, uh, system work for housing projects or a particular structural or architectural um, requirement. So, you know, closing in summary, 
I prefer uh, formed concrete, a smooth as struck finish, minimal making good, but there will be a lot of situations where a, a block wall um, makes more sense. That's my comments on the subject. Thank you. So, okay, so you have had four contributions. I'm, I'm sure by now you must be formulating your own, your own position as to which you think is better. But I think the key, the key word here is better. That's the catch in this essay question. <laughs> which is better? And therefore you could ask better for what? Or better when? Better in what applications? So I'm going to leave the floor open for some questions and then we will interact with, with the panel and then we can wrap up in about 15 minutes time. So any questions, anyone? Is it comparing the concrete to the block? Let's say you have a structure in which you want to cut and to create doors or any other adjournments. I think the block itself, even in terms of the site and structure that you might be going, should be, as the engineer from your stand said, concrete might be there, but black is better. So what do we look for in putting up a structure? Do we look for what is better or what is cheap? It depends on, on, on who you are. Mr. Bower said that block work is cheaper than concrete. When, you look, when overall for the project, concrete is cheaper because of the fact that you don't have to render. And rendering is a very expensive item in construction work. So it all depends, as I said, cheaper. It depends on what you, the client, can afford at the time to make your decision. But safety is what we would call more than cheapness at this time. Well, but <coughs> we're, not talking about, we're not talking about structurally sound. The block and steel is structurally sound just as well as concrete, but it depends on what you can afford at the time when the works are to be done. Respondent just mentioned that, uh, that, that, that that was said by me in particular that um, that block is better. I, I mean, we haven't really settled the case in terms of saying which is, is better. And, and our chairman, David Garrett, just mentioned that better for what? And I think it is a good kind of slant to go in, 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 in small, in some cases, the other part of, of our presenter from here he would, would figure blocks would be ideal. And, and it then depends, of, of course, on one determining what, where they are in terms of uh, the particular project location. In some cases, um, you might not be able to carry large equipment to a particular point, and, and blocks might be the, the, the most ideal kind of material to put there. And so, so, yeah, so, so, so everything generally would have to be looked at on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, and so, and, and so determine which is best or better in whatever particular case um, that you're looking at. So yeah. my curiosity, in a general, can you speak of the thermal properties of both of them? Because one would think that in a tropical climate where we live in, uh, we know that when we live in concrete homes, it tends to be hotter because the sun tends to penetrate the concrete poorly versus that of the block where the void act as a Insulator for what? Can you speak of the properties yeah, no, of the thermal properties? So there are no vibes, so to speak. I'll turn it, I'll turn it. Yeah, and a certain level is I'll turn it. That's true. I'm talking from a, in terms of, in terms of, it's cheaper. It is from different perspectives. I'm talking from a, a household perspective. Yeah. 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 Yeah
to the same density as, as the form concrete. So there is a little, there is a clearly up the point that, that the blocks would be, will have, um, will carry less heat load, or essentially um, you have a cooler structure with a block and steel as opposed to um, a form concrete structure. If you're just, I mean, just compare it that way. The fact though is that if you, if, I, if we should go beyond that, it would be a matter of design. If you are looking at your structure, you want to say, since this is formed concrete, and therefore you put larger windows. But essentially, if you're comparing just block with formed concrete, naturally, you would think that the, the, the formed concrete will have a higher heat. Isn't it possible for us to design the concrete that is being poured into the blocks, even to match the strength of um, concrete being poured in farms? So couldn't, couldn't you say that both of them are equal when it comes on to strength and durability, depending on the designer? I could say you're right, though there are challenges, right? Um, if you're speaking to about hollow concrete blocks, then you are speaking, you, you will require also that the, the, those block pockets be filled. The issue of quality control then comes in also in terms of do would you if you can be assured that you could fill those pockets with the, with the same strength concrete and and also part of the technology would understand is that concrete the wet concrete doesn't normally adhere um as a, a, to, to to hard to to harden concrete you know it, it, with a kind of bond that is that is that is that is seem considered excellent at times so it is it is generally you are generally able to get um for, for design form concrete higher strength than than for than than, than for the, 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 the hollow concrete blocks that we that we I think we are talking about here. Okay. So then in form work as well, formed concrete and the, the rebar you can design your, your reinforcement as you choose. So I, I would say certainly uh, you know formed concrete you can get whatever strength you want but you're you're fairly stuck with the, the strength of blocks you're limited with the block limited yes, stuff, yes. Quest. overall for the project not comparing concrete walls with block walls but overall i have not done the a, 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 a cost analysis and the the, the the temperature issue but just a little that i was made to understand is that concrete has a, a, a better property in terms of preventing the external temperature from coming in as well as the internal temperature from going out. So in that regard, I would say concrete, and Mr. Umeva wanted to take that on, concrete will be better in terms of monitoring the temperature within a building. Okay, interesting. Any other question? I don't, a, a female voice would be great. <laughs> I agree. Um, I see a female there. So, sorry. Bridgerine. Okay, go ahead. Females don't want to talk So, that information that has been, um, that you're providing, is there any website or any document that uh, provides it so we could probably after later they go and take a look at it? Yeah. Jamaica Institute of Quantity Surveyors. Right. I'm, I'm a representative, Mr. Allen from the Bureau of Standards, from the Block Making Association, and Mr. Bohr from CARE. So, I of us. You can contact for further information. About between the block and the, the former, the topographic conditions of um, the environment, does it have an effect on which one of them? And um, which one of them have more effect? It have more effect on. If I would look at it from an environmental aspect. Uh, the more the more the more concrete that you use are essentially you will be using up more carbon footprint right? so any particular structure that uses less concrete would actually have a less impact on the environment right so in terms of if you are if, if that's the kind of uh, area that you're looking at in terms of what is the effect on the, on, on the environment I'm saying the more concrete that is used in structures is the greater effect on the environment, or negative effect on the environment because it increases the carbon footprint. Being that it utilizes more cement normally, so essentially you are, and cement manufacturing um, is one of the, the, the highest um, level of, uh, of, that contributes one to, to, to the, to the uh, carbon footprint, uh, one of the, at, the, at the high level. Which one of the materials can be 
used to build the highest story building? Concrete or, or cost institute concrete simply because you can design it and normally block and steel has a limitation in terms of how far you can go with that kind of structure. If you can make a large investment to buy the, the form, whether it's uh, uh, metallic or, or wooden or um, yeah. Yeah. ply, that's one. The size of your project, the location of your project, um, this, this, the, this space that you're using the form concrete or the block and seal on, and other issues that you just heard. But you just heard that you can always contact any of the four gentlemen here, and they're on the program, so you can always make some further checks. Now, the next session here in this room is going to be on the Jamaican workforce. Are we really, really, really ready for the hub? And the next room, the last two sessions, maximizing benefits from the special economic zones. My name is uh, Courtney Cosley. I'm here to introduce Mr. Michael Archer for this session, which is the dubbed the Construction Project Management, Better Technology for Better Results. This is room 2A, uh, 2A room 4. I just want to make sure that we are all in the right place. I know we are in the, in the right place, but I just want to make sure you are sure that you are in the right place. Uh, we have been in the seminar speaking about the logistics hub and uh, integral to the hub and the construction and all the developments we have heard of earlier would be managing projects. Uh, project management we know is not, not, not generally confined only to building projects but any project. Uh, the logistics hub is a project in itself that is coming on stream and there would need to be project managers for it. Um, any project you do at your home or your office or any kind of endeavor which, uh, in which you are engaged requires some kind of management. And so too is the construction industry. We have been reminded earlier that uh, with these developments coming that there will be a lot of projects coming on stream. And in the earlier parts of this program, we uh, some session speaks of tools, some session speaks of the re relevant and necessary materials to be used, some session speaks of the type of skills that are needed. And so as part of that, we recognize what is also very important, critical, is project management. Now, I'm just here to introduce as a forerunner, uh, Mr. Michael Archer, who is our presenter for this session. Mr. Archer is a civil engineer with a BSc from St. Augustine, Trinidad. He has certificate in project management from Nova University in Canada and the University of the West Indies, Mona, here in Jamaica. Mr. Archer joined the public sector in 1977 and worked at the Ministry of Transport and Works in the Special Projects Division, dealing mainly with highway projects. He later moved, he joined the Ministry of Housing in 1979 and worked on the site and services projects financed by the World Bank. He rose to the level of Chief Technical Director of that unit. In June 1981, this unit was transformed to a state development company where he became general manager. In 1983, the estate development company expanded and took over the responsibility of the National Development Agency of Jamaica. This company was owned by the government and undertook government projects. In 1992, he took up a position as the regional advisor for the South African Urban Development Project financed by the United States Agency for the International Development, that is USAID. 
While in South Africa, he rose to the position of chief of party in projects. He returned to Jamaica in 1998 and joined Surrey Paving and Aggregate Company Limited as a consulting engineer and project manager. He currently holds a position as chief technical director of SPA, which has grown to be a regional engineering and contracting firm here in Jamaica and the Caribbean region. Mr. Archer is married with four children. He holds a position in the following organizations and associations. Director of Pelican Bay Development Company Limited, St. Kitts and St. Lucia. Director, Jamaica Employer, Employers Federation. Director, Carb Share and Energy Renewable Firm. Director, Stella Mars Foundation. Past President of the Incorporated Master Builders Association of Jamaica 2006 to 2008 and member of the Jamaica Institute of Engineers, and member also of the America Associates Society for Civil Engineers. Uh, after all these accolades, I guess I don't have to say to any of you that there couldn't be a more appropriate person to speak to you in the matter of project management. And so, I'll now hand over to you, and we will sit and listen to Mr. Michael Archer. Uh, thank you, Courtney. Um, I know time is, is an issue here, and um, so I'll try and see if I can condense what I have to say so that we at least have some time for some questions. Um, for, firstly, uh, I must commend the previous um, presenters. The last session and the last segment of that presentation was one of the issues that I was going to raise and raise it in a, in a larger sense in terms of some other technological applications that are useful and necessary for um, the kind of project management and how we as contractors, and I know there are a lot of students here, but, um, but how we as contractors can in fact um, make the best use of the opportunities that are coming forward as it relates to the um, logistic hub and the, the other developments that surround that initiative. But firstly, let me, um, try and contextualize strategically how as contractors, small, medium, or large, we need to look at the industry today. And to do that, I want to just reflect back on my return to Jamaica. I was encouraged to return to Jamaica um, by a group um, including Surrey Paving um, because there was a concern that there are a number of large projects that were on hand that local contractors seem to be um, excluded from. This was a concern um, big raised, big, you know, in, two, in, in 98, this was after what we could call the FinSAC era and a lot of contracting firms had lost a significant amount of capacity in order to pre-qualify and undertake large projects. I know the present, current president has been very active in trying to um, protect and to increase the opportunities for local contractors in the construction sector, and more so um, this is a new concern as we look to another wave, hopefully, of construction activity that will um, happen 
as a result of the the, the um, logistic hub. Now, my recommendation at the time was that there would be very little that government would do or can do to protect the local construction industry. The best protection is to, in fact, develop systems and, and capacities that are consistent with best practice internationally and to find a way to translate that to the clientele or the market in general to ensure that we are seen here in Jamaica as contractors with the capacity and the capability to carry out large-scale projects. How can we do that? Firstly, we have to look at what is out there. Um, in 1998, there was a significant push in terms of transport infrastructure. Significant amount of roadworks were on hand. Um, as we went closer to 2000 and into 2000, there was a significant um, push for building construction services for hotel expansion. Um, <clears throat> the local business and contractors seem to have not been able to take advantage of or have been excluded by policies of government or the investors and the nature of the investment to, to actually benefit from this, the, the hotel development that took place during the 2002-2006-2008. And one of the recommendations that I made at the time as I said earlier, is that unless we can demonstrate that we have the capacity right, to produce for, in an efficient way, for these investors that are coming in, that um, we would not get that opportunity. Um, there are other things that government could do, and in some cases have done, but the agencies that are involved with government that are involved with procurement, or responsible for procurement, didn't see it fit to exercise those options. One, the president raised earlier in his presentation this morning, was the margin of preference. Um, that has not been used in any way, shape, or form um, to allow local contractors to grow and expand and to take um, advantage of these opportunities. The, the other area where um, we have not been able to um, take advantage of these opportunities is just based on the, the nature of the investments that we're now getting. Um, these are large investments, and so there are a lot of contractors who went through the, the recession who couldn't meet the pre-qualification requirement. A suggestion was made by the minister, and I think also by uh, most of, well, um, Professor Shirley, that we probably need to look at how we can group together and pool our resources to ensure that we can provide the critical mass that would allow us to pre-qualify some of these contracts. But we have moved way past that currently because given the strictures that we now have in terms of government, a lot of the developments that will be pursued in the near future will actually will be PPPs, private-public partnerships. And in most cases, all the government is going to be is a promoter and a facilitator and will not, in fact, be designing, as in the case of... Um, the Portland by project, um, but will in fact just be providing support to private developers 
in order to um, have growth and economic activity um, re resume at a rate that is acceptable to us as Jamaicans. How do we benefit from that? We look strategically at what outside of that ambit we can do. There's a talk about 10,000 jobs being created by the Portland Bite Project. Um, Professor Shirley spoke um, about other opportunities um, for Kingston Transshipment Terminal, for the tourism um, terminals, etc. But just think about it. There are 10,000 new jobs being on offer at the end of this development. That's going to require housing. That's going to require commercial development. That's going to require some level of government infrastructure, sewage, water supplies, um, private sector investments in relation to commercial and, and, and other support um, infrastructure and facilities. That is where, as local contractors, and I know there are students here, but I'm just focusing primarily, firstly on, on local contractors. I talk about issues of training when I get into the other part of the discussion. So those are what is on offer. How do we position ourselves as contractors to benefit from this? Uh, again, we have to do that by demonstrating that we have the capacity to, to, um, to deliver. Um, and I'm just going to use some examples that um, has happened as the, the company that I know um, work for. Social media is now a major part of our lives. If you are into construction and you have a construction established company, you have to be on social media. Um, you have to understand that, um, as I said, strategically you have to analyze where the work is and to go after it. But similarly, you need to basically have your um, organization out there. And let me give you an example. Um, Sir Pavin, which initially was primarily into infrastructure, airport, um, port um, development, highways, etc. Um, we're now into buildings and other things, because there's another issue, and that is creating your own employment um, opportunities. I, I get a call from um, a company or an entity in St. Thomas indicating that they have a runway that they want to refurbish. Um, how did they get in contact with Sir Pavin? They simply was looking through airport projects, just going to Google and put airport projects, whatever, and Sangsa Airport came up. St. Kitts Airport project come up. Who are the contractors? Sir Pavin. Our um, address and contact is on our, 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 our Facebook and on our, our website. And so I get a call um, um, asking if we would be interested in looking at a development in St. Martin. Um, similarly, uh, we're a regional company. We have operations in St. Kitts. I get a call from somebody in Grenada or St. Vincent for the same reason. Um, we understand you did a perimeter road in Nevis, um, and we see that on your website. Right? The other side of it is your credibility. Now, the minister mentioned it this morning. He indicated that there's only, there, there are not many Jamaican firms that are internationally certified, ISO. 9,000 certified. 
this is a costly exercise, but if you're going to be in the construction of today, you need to have international certification. Um, I had a difficulty convincing my firm, given the cost, um, 10 years ago, to pursue that um, goal of getting international certification. Having gotten that certification, I think we probably are the only local indigenous construction company with that certification that has changed not only our profile to the wider clientele, but also how we operate internally, which is where I'm getting to in terms of project management, to ensure that we can increase our profitability, increase our um, productivity, and we are in fact in a position to go after the projects that seem to be um, reserved for international contractors and actually beat some of those contractors at the bidding process. But that is to the extent that their bidding process is out there. We had Jamaica National at, at the earlier um, session and they are of course sponsor or major sponsor of this, this, this seminar. Most governments that have high debt are now not into the position to use budgetary and loan funding um, guaranteed by the government to finance infrastructure development. Much of that development will now take place only where a financier, a developer, and a gov the government partner, partner can put together that project. The government is not any longer in a position to provide um, the guarantees that allow for international loans simply to take on these projects. And so as contractors, we need to start to engage the financial institutions who have a lot of money out there and government paper is no longer a secure way of, of, of investing anymore, who are willing to with us package projects that allow for implementation and similar to the way the Chinese have come and use the fact that they have the cash to back their proposals, we need to find partnerships with the local financial institutions and define projects, whether they're housing and infrastructure, and there are a number of opportunities, even in infrastructure now, um, as the North South Highway and Highway 2000 um, demonstrate, that can be utilized uh, to create opportunities for local developers and le local contractors. So that's where we need to go. The other thing is that these projects now require contractors to have more than just the capacity to provide equipment to carry out the works. They have to have management, and in some cases that management have to be management and technological capacity to do designs. A lot of the projects now on offer will require design bill, even within the, 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 the government institutions now, because of the lack of capacity, and I don't want to get myself in trouble here, but of some of the the, the, the agencies involved in, in, in the management of infrastructure projects, they're now giving out design bill projects or, or contracts. And so contractors need to develop the capacity to be able to respond to those kinds of projects because government is not going to step in and help us in any way, shape or form. Um, I don't run out of time, you know, and I just want to talk a little about um, the project management system. Most firms now have to implement a quality management system. And that quality management system must be based on 
um, ensuring that we apply the technological um, advancements and techniques that are now available to us to ensure that we can have a comparative or competitive advantage. The problem is that in the construction sector, everybody is using the same raw material. Um, materials, same, same cost of equipment, the same um, cost of, of, of materials and all the inputs. The difference is how your methodology and so any system put in place must address the issue of how do I get a comparative advantage? And that comparative advantage is in most cases determined by the system you have in place. The other thing is that to get growth, your system must be one that allows you to analyze your results to determine whether those results are, can be improved and to apply the resources needed for improvement. The resources we're talking about here are management um, and to some extent technology. Or, uh, technology. Um, there are large projects that can be managed with low number of people by virtue of applying available softwares and available systems that are crucial and necessary for um, the success of these projects. So I can't, don't have the time to go into um, a lot of the, the, the softwares that are out there, but I can give you one example. Um, in 2002, sorry, Paving won a hundred million dollar contract. This was actually 14 tenders that came out simultaneously. We happened to win all the tenders. They were in parishes. We won all the tenders except one, Portland. There was a big debate as to whether they should be all awarded to us. Okay. Um, at the end of the day, we were awarded um, the 13 out of the 14 um, tenders that were, were out there, the NARI program. That involved a large undertaking. We bought software that at the time cost 200,000 US dollars, uh, Primavera, which we now use as part of our management tool. Um, that allowed us to engage, to actually carry out construction on 138 road sections all over the island, engaged 38 subcontractors, and every month I was able to, by virtue of the system put in place, to be able to provide certificates for every subcontractor on time, to provide a composite certificate to the government, to provide all the quality assurance um, reporting that was required for both government and for our own internal quality control um, system, and also to provide information on procurement of materials. I supplied all the aggregate, I supplied all the emulsion, and I, I had to be able to account for and, and have uh, control over all of that activity. And that was one software. Now, it's a $100 million project, US. And so paying $200,000 for the software and the training was worth the effort, uh, worth the, the investment. And so what I'm saying is that as contractors, we need to look at our operation, look at what technologies are out there. Um, it is important that we develop a system that is that represent international best practice in relation to how we operate. And in that way, we will be able to 
take advantage of some of the opportunities that are here. I just want to say it is important that we employ that kind of technology. I just did a survey of, of staff recently, and one of the things that was highlighted in terms of a performance evaluation system is how do we get access to technologies that will allow us to be marketable um, in the international sphere. Um, and so it is important for contractors, if they're going to um, succeed in this environment, that we pursue that kind of strategy in relation to the development of our business and also um, create the opportunities for Jamaica contractors to have a greater share in the construction activities that will accrue as a result of the initiatives by government related to the um, logistics hub. I want to thank you for your patience and I don't know if there are any questions or if we have any time for questions. I just to recap, I, I gathered from what has been presented, and if we have been observing the slides, it would um, be giving you a picture of what he has been saying in words, of uh, some of the ideas and, and the concept that he raised. Uh, I noted that Mr. Archer did bring to our attention uh, quality management systems and the applying of technology, which he, he explained would incorporate methodologies and systems that would give one competitive advantage in this industry. Uh, we cannot overemphasize, as you would see running through the theme of this um, conference, that technology and technological advancement is one of the factors that we have to pay attention to for us to be measuring up to the first world standards and uh, as was said earlier um, so we can play our part and be ready for competition with the other stakeholders who will be vying for their place in this um, coming um, logistics up. Uh, software application um, everybody now has more or less uh, digital instruments. Everybody more or less have um, Android phones and other such phones that can do most things. In our last um, seminar, it was brought to our attention that there are applications that can be used on your phone, as simple as it is, that can do some of these, um, the, ha which has software can do, that can do some of these works for us, that can make it easier for us to, to bring out the results that would have taken in former times a longer time to achieve the same result. Uh, I thank Mr. Archer and I thank you for your attendance in this session. We'll be moving to the next session in this same room, which is um, quite an interesting one. Jamaica, the Jamaican workforce, are we really ready? for the hub. For those of you who are interested in this um, topic, you can remain here. While in the next um, room, there will be another session which speaks to the maximizing benefits from the special economic zones. I'm going to, first of all, introduce your panelists. But if you look at your program, you will recognize that Mr. Denver Finikin, Senior Director, Workforce Development and Employment at Heart Trust NTA, is to my immediate left. Beside Mr. Finikin is Professor Oliver Gossett, Chairman of the Apprenticeship Board. Professor Gossett in the middle. And finally, Mr. Winston Neal, Managing Director of Jamaica Plumbing Limited. Mrs. Cusberg, Brenda Cusberg, is unable to make it this afternoon. Without further ado and much else, I'm going to ask Mr. Finikin 
to give you a presentation. He says it's for two minutes. I'm hoping it's... I don't know what he will do in two minutes, but I hope it will be fulsome. Mr. Finnegan? The Hatcher Center is very responsive and flexible in developing the Jamaican workforce as it relates to national priorities and global competitiveness. And so we see our role as preparing the workforce, certainly the entry-level workers, for the global logistics hub. We have done extensive research as an organization as it relates to the jobs that will become available in the global logistics hub. Recognizing that we will not be able to train in all areas, we share this information with the education system to ensure that we have a ready workforce. Now, the question about the logistics hub is when will it be? And because the logistics hub is a process and not an event, we have to be working simultaneously with the investment. And so what we have done as a national training agency is to position our training to respond to any demand. And that's why we have a mission that is flexible and responsive. The fact is that we have a labor force of just over 1.3 million, 1,311,000, of which almost 70% is not trained and certified in the area of their work. And so as a national training agency, we're very serious about on-the-job training. This year alone, we intend to impact close to 50,000 persons. A great amount will be towards the logistics hub. But because the, 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 the activities are not moving at a pace, as we anticipate, we train in anticipation. And we have identified a number of courses, and have started a number of courses in preparation for the logistics hub to ensure that when the projects are on the ground, we have persons ready to work on those projects. The fact is, the Jamaican worker has to be far more productive and so it calls also for a mind change in terms of getting to work on time when we are at work to do work and not to suffer from what I call presenteeism, meaning we are at work, we are present, but we are not actively engaged. It's a workforce that will need to be reoriented towards cultural diversity. Um, we still, uh, our workforce is still not comfortable with serving, say, in a restaurant, persons who seems to be attracted to each other, same sex. So cultural diversity, and we have to discuss these things because being at the National Training Agency, we do provide workers for the international market and one of the things they always emphasize is that your workers are good, but sometimes when they see the same, same sex in a restaurant, they're unwilling to serve them. You know, and so with, with a logistics hub comes some, it has to come some tolerance also. Safety is also key. And what the National Training Agency will ensure is that the, the persons we train, they pay keen attention to safety. And that's the difference between a trained and certified worker or someone who learned by the pickup methods. And, and so the organization has implemented and will be implementing a number of courses. We already have courses in electromechanical technician, heavy duty equipment, um, truck driving, uh, steam dooring, forklift operation, renewable energy, and the list goes on. The contract, in negotiating contracts, it is important that those who are responsible ensure that the ratio of the Jamaican worker to the foreign worker is an equitable one. It's an equitable one. 
But we as a nation has to ensure that we understand what it means to be at work, to start working at 8. So if work is from 8 to 5, it's not to get to work at 8 and start working at 